And I'm very thankful to you all for reading um, what is obviously a more early stage draft than some of the other ones presented here. I perhaps have made the novice mistake of having too many projects coming to a head at once, so I was unfortunately missed some of the discussion yesterday at a conference um, presenting another paper on early customs laws and delegation, which is going to come out in the GW Law Review, which has some synergy with some of the topics in the current paper, but is a little bit, um, a little bit different. But I appreciate your comments at this uh, early stage. I thought what I would do is just briefly explain kind of the genesis of this current project and maybe my goals and the scope that I'm thinking um, of it, uh, that I'm thinking that I'll try to make it um, as it comes to fruition. Um, and then also um, keep my comments maybe a little bit briefer to get more of Will's feedback and some questions from, from you all. And then I will also pose a couple of questions to you all as I keep working on the project. But basically, um, previously, my, the major originalist paper that I put together was a more compre much more comprehensive style um, uh, research that I'm doing in this paper. It was analysis of the meaning of the phrase officers of the United States in the appointments clause, and it became kind of a 120 page tome, more than a 700 footnote article. Um, and so I'm trying to do a much more modest project this time around. One of the claims, though, that I had made in the appointments clause piece was that. Um, Part of what was going on with the appointments clause is that there were a limited number of people involved in selecting officers as one way to make there be um, accountability and transparency in officer selection. The idea that the limited actors who can pick government officers who are exercising power have to then take credit for that decision, so they're going to be more responsible to pick um, high quality, good actors who are going to help to lead the government. And in the course of discussing that project over um, a few month period, people asked me a lot about about the claim of it, the appointments clause as an accountability mechanism and what exactly was going on at the founding in terms of thinking through officer accountability and government accountability. And so what I thought I would do is take a little bit closer look at that. Um, so also in that paper, one source that I did not mine quite as deeply as some others were the ratification debate. So this paper is, was basically an attempt to kind of go back into the ratification debates as a whole and see um, <coughs> what they have to say about the various mechanisms for holding officers accountable in terms of the mindset of the framers. Um, and the ratification debates, obviously, as I'm sure um, we can see from uh, Josh and James's paper that they will present later on, are in no way like a comprehensive um, original meaning style analysis to go just into the ratification debates. I mean, if you take more of an original understanding approach, obviously the ratification debates would have a lot of meaning because the people who are making statements during the debates are the ones, obviously, who are um, ultimately voting the Constitution into being as governing law. So I do think there's a lot of... Um, relevance to that discussion, but I'm not necessarily framing the paper as if I'm trying to prove that all of the things that were said or done or talked about necessarily. Um, I have evidence to suggest that it all has to be adopted wholesale into modern practice. So I'm, I'm using this paper try, to try to basically bring out information, be somewhat descriptive, and then maybe a little bit normative in the sense that I'd like to um, talk in the paper a little bit as I'm analyzing the various debates and various discussions about what it might say for modern practice. But I would actually value a lot of feedback on whether um, currently the paper strikes that balance the right way, whether um, it's even possible if all I'm doing is looking at the ratification debates and trying to extrapolate implications for modern law. Um, in any case, um, it's, it's written to be a little bit more of a narrative, basically, about what it was um, the ratifiers thought were going to be the ways that we were going to keep a check on government governmental power. And basically right now the paper breaks it down um, into three main categories. And so it seems as though the ratifiers, when they were having discussions, thought that one thing that was going to keep government power in check obviously was going to be electoral accountability. Um, and so some of the interesting threads that come out in that discussion are um, that the frame, the ratifiers seem to think that um, even the way that the House and the Senate and the President were all elected differently, the more directly that um, the governing body was elected by the people, that had a real impact on the share of power that was supposed to be held. So there's a lot of discussions about the House of Representatives even having a greater share of the policy making 
power, um, its unique role in revenue-raising legislation, this descriptive claim that because the House is closest to the people and can um, have revenue-raising measures and they have to initiate there, that that's going to enable the House to protect itself and its powers against encroachment from the Senate and the President. Um, but the other common thread um, is this idea that the only really way that you can exercise governmental power is if in some indirect sense there's accountability back to the electorate. Obviously, it's much attenuated with the judicial branch and so the judicial branch has the least power. Um, but I do think in my, the main area that I, of law that I write in is administrative law. And so if that's true, if the source of legitimacy for governmental power is having some link back to elected officials, then obviously that has a lot of implications for um, our current administrative practices. Then the second broad category is more of the structural accountability mechanism, separation of powers, obviously federalism. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how, of course, the members are going to keep things in check because they're going to be subject themselves to the laws they create. There's discussion about transparency, recording business, being able to ask for recorded votes. Um, then there's the individualized, um, oh, the one other thing too, actually, and Judd Campbell's really the one who's written about this, but there's also discussion in sort of the structural accountability mechanisms that the federal officials, some of them, Madison and some others, think that one um, way to keep things accountable would be if actually some of the federal operations were um, taken on by state officers. So there does not seem to be an understanding that that would have been constitutionally prohibited. They ultimately decide not to do it. Actually, in the other paper I wrote, I had been writing on early customs laws. Um, there's debate and discussion and proposals on the House floor about getting state officers and state, actually the state systems for collecting customs in place to make sure that they can start collecting revenue right away um, to pay off wartime debt. And they decide ultimately not to go with that approach, but it's because some of the states don't have in place um, well worked customs collecting mechanisms, and so they're concerned about issues of fairness. They're not in any way concerned about issues of constitutionality. And then the final section of the paper talks about more individualized accountability mechanisms, obviously impeachment, taking of the oath of office, and then there are discussions um, where there's an assumption that working in tandem with impeachment, actually a big mechanism that's going to be uh, available to people is um, being able to bring common law liability and sue officers. And there's some discussion, you know, certainly we can't expect that the only way to challenge officer behavior is impeachment and make people go all the way to the Capitol to prove their case. We don't have to worry about that, though, because you can bring officers into a court of law um, and keep them accountable, uh, accountable that way. Um, and then there's also some sort of assumption that, um, or at least acknowledgement, that one other way officers were, as a practical matter, kept accountable is many of them had to make um, bond payments up front before they entered office, um, which I, I suppose would have been a way for people to be able to recover against them in the case that, in the case of bad acting and needing to recover against them in court. So that's sort of the gist of the paper at this point. And as I say, I would value um, feedback on the division of how normative versus descriptive it can or should be. And then the second thing is right now at the beginning, I am not sure that I'm packaging it actually in an accurate a way that accurately describes what I then go on to discuss. I think it's possible that I might be trying to make too much connection between this project and the one I did previously. So I'd also value feedback as to whether um, the issues that I'm trying to talk about later on substantively are being um, adequately framed or accurately framed at the start of the paper. Um, so with that, I will hand things over to Will.